So, good afternoon. So I'm here to talk to you about remixing usability with performance. So we had a lot of uh, a lot of talks already about um, data fetching and rendering and the user experience about it. So that's we're going in that direction as well. Um, hopefully, I say something new though. Um, so about me, um, my name is Attila or Achila. Um, whatever rolls out of your tongue easier, as long as I understand you're talking to me. Um, I'm a DX engineer at Zara. Um, what that essentially means is that um, like Zata is in the uh, serverless database space. So we build a project for developers, which means if I work at developer experience, that means essentially user experience because developers are, are users. So that's essentially what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, you can find me easily on my, this website, attila.io. And if you just do like the slash social media, you can also find me there. Um, it has some redirects and whatever. Otherwise, I'm Attila Fasin in pretty much every place. Um, so yeah, so before we start talking about uh, what we're actually here to talk about, about the data fetching and rendering and handling mutations, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about uh, design. So if we destructure design, if we break it down into smaller concepts, uh, we usually get like the user interface, user experience, and in my experience, most often the conversation ends there. So we talk about the UI, we talk about the UX, but there's a third component that I think it's really, really important to have in mind, which is usability. And to me, they, it is so important because um, whenever we are doing that, if we if we're to draw a Venn diagram of what design actually means, like you have the UI, with, where um, it's where you define the content and how those different pieces of content relate to themselves. So um, if component if part A of your content is close to part B and they are related or not, and then you get the UX where it's going to dictate, it's going to describe essentially how the user is going to interact with such UI. So if the interaction is easy, if the interaction is comfortable, if it's ergonomic, then you're basically going through UX. But how comfortable it is, how ergonomic it is, how actually useful it is, is going to define usability. Uh, because um, sometimes if your, the UX is so bad that it ca the user cannot use it, it's not really bad UX, it's just unuseful. It's lack of usability in this case. And that's what I'm going to talk about because uh, performance, um, if we're like, there's like the, the part where we optimize for performance, which is nice, we're building on top of an of a UX, existing UX, of an existing experience, and we're trying to make it better. But there's also parts of the performance that if we let it degrade or if we don't, care for it, then it, the app's not usable anymore. And then it hurts usability. So for example, let's say we, we all created the app and in isolation, it works perfectly fine. So the app's beautiful, it's there, it's deployed, works on every browser you tested. Um, thanks, Debbie. Uh, it's very well tested and working. And then the user comes in and does what users do. You just click around and then something your app looks like that. <laughs> We're really applauding a bunch of loading spinner. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, that's essentially like what's going to happen by default. Um, like not actually by default. Somebody put work into putting those spinners there, which is actually kind of surprising nowadays. Uh, but essentially, like if we're going to break down how it works. Like I'm going to break down this thing into four different areas. So you have first the user, which is a person. Then you have the UI, which is what you're seeing in your browser. You have what I'm calling the program, which is what's going to handle the logic of whatever is rendering. It might be your client-side React. It might be whatever other framework you have, the DOM, whatever. And then the API, which I'm using as an umbrella term. It can be anything. It can be your database can be uh, an external API, can be your rendering engine, whatever. So essentially the user goes and clicks on the user interface. The user interface is going to tell the program, oh, there's a mutation happening. Somebody's doing stuff to, to the app. 
that program eventually needs to go into the mutation, send a mutation request to your backend. The backend is going to do a response. And this is the part where you're basically throwing the user experience up in the air because it depends on a bunch of stuff. It depends on servers connecting to each other. It depends on the user connection. You cannot really tell how fast it is um, this part. And then the program receives and says to the UI, OK, update the content. And finally, the user sees something. So only going through that, and I didn't even go anywhere, only describing this already takes a long, a long time. So I think we can do better than this, uh, honestly. Uh, because like, sorry, if we go through this, uh, what's happening essentially is that the mutation request is going to only be as fast as the click ring response and the mutation event, uh, event combined. And those are only, and the feedback that the user is going to receive is only going to be as fast as all those chained events. So those chain events have another name, which, uh, um, and if we go back in time to the times of like MTV video clips and whatever, there was this band that liked to talk about it. And they told you to, don't go chasing, what? Go, yeah, what is that? Waterfalls, yeah, anybody knows this song? Everybody heard this song? Yeah, so the song's from 1995, by the way. Um, if you're not feeling old yet, uh, like me, but yeah. So they were not essentially talking about um, rendering performance, I guess, um, but there was some foreshadowing there. Um, and so I'm here to talk to you about being a little bit more optimistic on your apps uh, and handling those mutations in what I believe to be a little bit more elegant way of doing this. So, um, I just, you know, yeah, anyway. So let's try something new. Let's try something different. The user is going to click on it. The interface is going to send a mutation event to the program. And the program is going to return because the program is already taking that mutation event to a request. So I know what the user is trying to change. If I already know what the user is trying to change, why don't I just give it to them? Okay, here it is. Meanwhile, I'm still going to the backend. I'm still sending the mutation request. The mutation request is coming back successful. So all that waiting turns out was for nothing because I already had the data on the first place. So we can be optimistic about it, most cases, because as the pessimistic developer is going to say, we always need to expect what cannot be expected. We, can all, we cannot prevent bugs. Like if, if bugs were intentional, we wouldn't have them, right? Um, so, but the, this kind of partition, this kind of problems, they actually happen in one every 999.9 percent cases, totally not fake statistics. Um, so let's go again. Let's pretend there is some kind of problem in our database. Uh, so we click, we send a user interface. Uh, the user interface sends a mutation request, everything again. We update, user is happy, preparing to go on. Eventually, our request goes boom. So we, the program is going to tell the UI, oops, something happened. And then the UI, then we can finally react to that. We can catch that error, we can see that error happening, and we can tell the user, okay, something happened on the back end. I still have your data. Do you want to try again? And this is the moment where, um, and, and, and then the user can decide if they're going to try again, if they're going to reload, if they're going to give up, whatever. So this seems like a very nice uh, approach, but there are some important cases. So the first one, is if this happens too often, as I mentioned, like if the problem is happening too often, then you probably have a bug somewhere. If your API and your uh, client, if your client side and your server side are not communicating well, that's a, there's a bug somewhere that needs to be fixed. You cannot just trust your error handling all the time. That's like really for the unexpected cases. And second of all, it is not a silver bullet because it's not supposed to be used on every case. You're not going to say, okay, from now on, I'm going to be optimistic and going to be the fastest app in the world. Um, because there are situations where you don't actually want it to be. 
So when can you be? First, when the response is not critical to the user experience. For example, on a login form, you don't want to be optimistic about it because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you need to check that password. Or, for example, if you're, if you're doing, like, um, if you have a bank, you don't want to be optimistic about a transaction. You don't want to be eventually consistent. You need to always know, like, where that money is going um, so people don't get upset, I guess. And, first, and last of all, it's important that you can trust the availability of that resource. So um, even if it's okay to be eventual, because like likes on a tweet or something like that, or comments in a, in a blog post, you can be optimistic about it, but there's also like that other problem where if the connection is likely to break down between your client and your server, you might not want to because um, if you cannot trust how often is that resource and also there's the time of that confirmation that you need to be able to react on because if it ends up taking too long, if it has like a big latency or something like that, there is always a chance that the user already moved on when you got the error and then that's another problem for you to think about. So it's always a trade-off. Like it's not something, oh, I just saw this working in this stage by this whatever dude and I'm going to use that everywhere because he said it. No, um, just, you know, look at your app, look at the experience you're trying to design and go for it. So it's a React conference and I've been only talking about UX and usability all this time. So let's start talking a little bit about React. And I'm bringing Remix uh, for one reason, because Remix is built with this kind of UX in mind. They repopularize the term, I would say. So with the, with the pending UI and then afterwards with the optimistic mutation. So they have some nice APIs uh, and abstractions for us to implement this kind of stuff. So I want to show you um, how well, some of two ways actually you can do this. There are more, but I'm going to show you two ways that I tend to think they're the most ergonomic. But before that, we need to have a look about how Remix uh, works. So the first thing of Remix is that it has this loader function. Um, there's one thing that's annoying me. So, um, oh, great. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so let's go again. This I need to take out. Like there's some <laughs> weird bug over here. Let me fix my slides. Uh, what? I have a typo, obviously. Yeah, so. <laughs> and now let's go to my slides. Yeah, that's, oh, that looks better. So the loader function uh, is going to run every time a page is loading, so on the rendering of the page, which means essentially it's going for get requests. And the way we connect the loader function from our page component is with the hook user loader data. So it's going to just take whatever serialized object our loader function is going to spit out and is going to give to pass on as render props, essentially. And then for the other kinds of data, for um, mutations, per se, we have um, the action function, which in a nutshell, it's going to render for all the other ver HTTP verbs. So post, put, delete, and patch um, requests. And there are multiple ways that we can hook into those. The most common one, the one that you see first in the docs, is the use uh, action data, which is not the one we are going to use, but it's, it's good to be mentioned. We are going to first start with the use transition. And if you've been here since the beginning of the day, you also you already heard about some use transitions, but that was a different one. That was a React use transition. So the one Tejas was talking about on the when he mentioned the Suspense API is a different use transition hook. Um, somebody's going to have to do something about that, but not me. I'm just here to disambiguate. And the use transition in Remix, there are three situations it runs, and it has three different behaviors for them. So the first one, <coughs> sorry, I have a no. <clears throat> Thanks. First one is when you navigate. The second one is when there is a get request from a file submission. And the third one 
is when you are having a mutation or when you have any one of the other verbs for a form submission. All of them starts from idle, but whenever you have a navigation, you go through a loading state and finally back to idle. So whenever there's a navigation, it runs, renders, and comes back. And then for the get form submission, it goes from submitting because the form is going up, and then it alre it's already idle again because it's going to trigger a re-render. And finally, whenever you're doing a form submission with, uh, with a mutation, with a post request most often, you go from submitting, then you go from load to loading, and finally, you're back into idle. So submitting is whenever the data is going, loading is when the data is coming back, and idle is when we're waiting for another, um, when the, the cycle is done. So this is essentially how a page component is going to work. So like what's not showing here for this page JSX um, route is the loading uh, logic and the action function. But essentially your React component uh, is this. <clears throat> so first we have the initial data that's coming from our loader. So whenever our page is going to be rendered on the back end. And when this happens, I have this, okay, if the transition state is not submitting, I want to use that loaded data. And if that, lo if that initial data is not there, I'm just gonna say nothing. Um, and then whenever there's a submission or a transition is happening, I'm going to check that transition state and see if it has submitting. If it is, I'm gonna be optimistic about it. So I'm going to sniff that submission that is going up, that data that's going out of my app and I'm going to bring that form data. By the way, this form data is not a React thing, it's not a Remix thing, this is a DOM thing. This is uh, your browser serializing the data from a form to send to the server. So that's the API we're using. It's web, uh, you can find on MDN uh, and something like that. It's not a Remix thing. So we're going to get the username, which is essentially the name of my input, and then it brings me back the value as a string. Um, so that's essentially all the logic you need to be optimistic on Remix. Um, so let me, let me show you how it goes. Um, so for the use transition, I have this little app over here. That's basically an app that I'm going to tell people what I want to have for dinner or whatever. Um, yeah, and here, just so you know, I have my database here, which I'm using Zeta, by the way, because, you know, I work there and my boss is looking at me, uh, <laughs> joking like. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I'm going to use that. So this is for you to see that there's no, no tricks up my sleeves. My database is empty. You can see there's no date over here. And now I'm going to tell you that I want to have some Belgian frites. Frites, frites, how's it say? Yeah, is this right? Awesome. So I'm going to send it to the, to the server, and you're going to see here that my app is going to be very optimistic about it. So right now I'm eating nothing for dinner, but I'm not going to wait my server to tell me that I can. I'm going to eat whatever I want. So I'm already going to eat my fruits, but it's still submitting. And I put like a throttle inside, so just to take a more time so you can have it. So there you go, and I come here, and that is it. So the data is on my server but it was already updated before. So let's, thank you. So this is essentially what's, what's happening. So let's do that again. Let's go for Italian pizza. Oops, no, not that. Uh, Italian pizza. And as you can see again, like nothing. And then it wrote, and then we come back and it's loading. And there you go. So that's basically how you do with the, the mutations. The code is open source. I'm going to sh share the slides on Twitter after it. Uh, and here's the link above, but it's, on, it's open source on GitHub. But there's another way of doing that. So Remix is also prepared for highly interactive apps. And then they have a, um, a hook called use fetcher. So use fetcher is this hook that lets you uh, once you plug into your UI, it allows you to um, run the actions and the loaders without actually navigating. Because 
Remix defends the concept that every time you're changing data on your route, it's actually supposed to be a navigation. But for a few cases, we don't want that for get that really single, app, single page application um, behavior. So what happens for use fetcher is whenever you have a request, it's going to trigger the action function, and it's going to trigger the loader, loader function, but it's not going to re-render the whole app. It's just going to fetch it, just as you would with an Ajax request or something like that. And to power that, um, and to make those distinctions, Remix has three ways of uh, preparing your data. So you have three form components. The first one is the one we are all very familiar with. That's from HTML, so that's basic HTML thing, and that's essentially the fallback. As you've seen, Remix works without JavaScript, so everything falls back to this. Then you have the form component, which is a React form abstraction of that one. So you can pass some additional props to make it work in a more React uh, way. And then you have that weird syntax, which is fetcher.form. So it's essentially uh, that same form component that is coming from the use fetcher hook. So in this case, my use fetcher hook is called fetcher uh, because I'm very creative. So um, I hook up to that and I pass that form in this case. So to use a use fetcher is pretty similar to the other one, uh, to use transition, but there's a few stuff that we can do uh, that makes it, in my opinion, a little bit better. So the first one is we're using the fetcher, so we get the data, we get the submission data, we get the submission object, and you have the state of the fetcher. And then to make everything fit more nicely, I stored my initial food in a variable. So if I have a fetcher data, I'm going to get the cuisine from that data in the dish, which are the names of my inputs. If not, I'm just going to use the loader data just as I was with use transition. And in this case, same thing as use transition. I check if the submitting is there, uh, and if it is, I'm going to use from it. If not, I'm just going to pass whatever is in the food. So um, here's how it goes with use fetcher. And as you can see, my app did not update. So yeah, I have the Italian for dinner because I'm hooking up to the same table. So I can just delete it, so you can see everything is there. And there you go, completely empty. So let's go again for my uh, fits. And you see it's loading, it's idle, and then it came back. Okay, so it's essentially the same. So check it out, it's still going to be the same thing. So. Um, American burrito, yeah. Uh, American burgers, so the same thing, optimistic, and then it goes back to idle. So it depends on where the thing's coming from. So the point of the use fetcher as well is that um, there's a second use fetcher kind of hook, which is use fetchers, and though that can give you more than one. That's especially useful if you, have, if you want to have more than one submission in a single view, so you can actually trigger them differently. Um, that's the catch with a uh, use transition, for example, where you need to use one form per view, as far as I know. So yeah, that was Remix, but I have a question for you now. Would you say that optimistic mutation is a Remix thing? Raise your hands. Nobody. Yeah, it's not. And to see how it actually goes on other apps, I'm going to bring you like Next.js. So Next.js doesn't have um, a mutation hook or a dedicated, um, dedicated API for that. So I'm using 10 stack query, which some of you might know as React query as well. You can you gotta raise your hands, whoever is familiar with? Awesome. So um, on Next.js, how it, it goes in a very similar way, but we use get server side props, which is the way we are going to do data fetching for our server side rendered pages. And for that, we're going to get then the query client and pass the initial data of that query. Whenever we hit, we hit the, uh, the client side, we hydrate that page with this data already. And we are going to get like an in memory cache provided by React query and get ready for wherever there's a mutation. Whenever there's a mutation, 
If it will go successfully, we re-render re the page with the new data, and we update the cache. So we have like a basically a new checkpoint. If it doesn't work, we're going to pull from the cache because we tried to be optimistic, it didn't work, so we take it back, and we rendered the page with the old data. And that's the important part. We need to warn the user that something blew up. So yeah. So Next.js has this uh, underscore app component, which is a convention for it. It's the component that's going to uh, render only once whenever you're already on the client. So this is what we're going to use to pass down the, our query provider. So we have this different syntax over here. We are storing the query client into a use state because what we actually want is to have this, uh, this instance of a query client once every time our app renders. And then we are just going to wrap our entire app in a query client provider and pass down the query client. That's it. That's the setup you need to get React Query working in Next.js. And then on our pages, we are going to have, in the component, we're going to use the, get the use query hook uh, here. And then the first part, the first parameter is an array with the names of the query. So this is going to be the cache key inside React Query. Then we have the action uh, this query is going to perform. So in this case, I'm going to get data. And we have the initial data. So we are passing the initial data to this hook. The way we get this initial data is on the get server side props. So we get my user, and then for page data, I'm going to fetch the data on server side rendering. So that's it. That's all you need to get to get server side rendering uh, on Next.js with React Query. And now this is a mouthful. So, <laughs> and I'm sorry for this slide. I'm going to try to break it down a little bit. But what we're doing here is having a custom hook um, with React Query to handle optimistically the mutations that our user is going to do. So in this case, I have a to-do app. Um, and this to-do app, is the mutation is basically going to do an add to-do. And then I'm going to pass three callbacks to it. On mutate, on error, and on settled. The most important, of course, is the mutate. So the mutate one, whenever it runs, it's going to say, okay, cancel all the queries for to-do. So I'm doing something. So it's basically going to, inv it's going to abort all the, qu the queries that are already in flight. So you don't have like any kind of race conditions or weirdness happening. Then I'm going to fetch my current cache. So with the stale data previous to my mutation, and I'm going to store in memory. So I, I'm putting this in this variable previous to do's, and then I'm going to set a new cache data. So um, I'm going to pass, like, I'm going to, uh, to prepend my new to do to my old to do's list and store it in the query. So I'm basically going to say, okay, React Query, this is the data now. And finally, I'm going to return the previous to do's. This is not doing anything in my runtime specific, like in my app, my component specifically. This is what the other callbacks are going to receive as params. So whenever something blows up, what I'm going to do is receive those three params, like the error that happened, the to-do that I tried to append, and the context. Inside the context, I, I get whatever I return on the mutation. So I get my previous to-dos. And then, because there was an error, what I need to do is put the valid data, data that is actually valid, back into my cache. So that's, only, that's all I'm going to do. And finally, on settled, like if you, if you think of it as a try catch, finally, this is the final. This is going to happen every time in the end of a mutation. So regardless if it was an error or success, I want to invalidate the queries. So if you think about Remix, uh, as we were seeing again, this is essentially what's going to be triggered the loader function, or it's basically say, okay, render again. So I just updated the cache, I updated the mutations, everything works, but all the, this query, this to do query is, uh, is invalid now fetch again from the server and make sure I have the, the latest and the freshest data. So that's it. Time to go look at our demo. Um, so here it is. So I have this to-do app. And the reason why this to-do app is like has my user and everything, this is like part of a, l a larger topic that I'm working on. But essentially, like I have this, I need to live demo at React Brussels. So this is done. Um, as you can see, it updated here, and then my UI confirmed. 
Uh, and now what I'm going to do is create a new uh, a new to do like um, yeah. It frits. That's a good. It frits. Amazing. So it went too fast. Yeah, I'm sorry. So yeah, data is already there. So we need to throttle that a little bit um, for you to actually see it being optimistic. So the first thing I need to do. Okay, slow 3G. Awesome. So let's go again. <laughs> so now it's taking a while and then it runs and it works. Great, but so far I'm being too optimistic. It's working every time, right? So we, don't, we want to see how it goes if it doesn't work all the time. So now I have this attempt and I want it only to work when my attempt is a multiple of three. So back here now, um, go for a run. So back here now, oh, it doesn't work. So I'm going to prompt my user, okay, wanna try again? And then I do again, okay, didn't work as well. And you can see it, like it tries to optimistically add it and then immediately removes it. And finally it works and I get it there. So uh, whatever, get run doesn't make any sense. Um, break slowly, uh, let's see. Here, again, throttled. What, that was not slow. Um, yeah. So it tries to, it tries to write and it can't. So you see there's this little blink. So that's my request trying to go. For some reason my throttle didn't obey me. But anyways, it tries to go and it doesn't. So it, this is the que React query working with all the cache. Yeah. So that's for Remix and Remix and Next.js. But not all of us are using Remix and Next.js in production. Oof, uh, in production. So I want to bring you some like more vanilla uh, use case for you. So this one is using Xstate library. So this is a way you can do with like vanilla React or I don't know, jQuery apps, whatever you want. So for this one, what we're basically doing is I'm creating a state machine that's going to handle all this logic. So we have like, we enter our state machine in the idle state, just like our others. Then we send a fetch and from the fetch, we have three possible, three possible states, done, fetch data, and another fe fetch data when it fails only once and so on. So let's see, it failed. So I wait and then I retry automatically after 500 milliseconds. Fetches again, fails again, and then we pull from this cache. Uh, and once, whenever we pull from this cache, we go back into idle, always. So that's essentially how it goes. And with that, you can just come here. I already have the link as well. Oh, I'm not gonna update now. Uh, so I already have the link here. You can come here to export and you can get like the JSON. You can get the JavaScript or the TypeScript one. This is going to get you the state machine that you can just shove it in into our create machine, whatever your app is. And yeah, the logic is there. So um, in, the, in my presentation, you have the link here for the editor. You can tweak it around and do something and then try in your app. If it doesn't work, you can just hook me up on Twitter, say, oh, it doesn't work, and then I'll go ask David. Um, but yeah, essentially that. Um, so yeah. And if there's no other takeaway from this talk, what I want you to take away from this is that being optimistic is cool. And that's it. Thanks a lot, React Brussels.